I never use yeah. it, but I should have it in case, in case I see, decided I need it. All right, you ready? Yep. All right. Well, welcome to the Coeur d'Alene School District 271 public budget hearing of June 13th, 2022. Would everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? And our flag, so our flag is typically here, so we'll just, uh, do we have one or we'll wait? We give us a second while we find our flag. <laughs> Let's all, you, you can have a seat till we find it. Let's find our flag. So until we find our flag. <laughs> Only if you want to come, I would invite you to come up and lead us in that. And I will turn off my microphone if that's the case. Can, can Seth project a, a flag? A flag? Yeah, That'd be great. Idea. Do we want to approve the agenda while we're doing Yeah, it? while we're finding our flag, let's go ahead and um, do I have a motion tonight to approve our agenda? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. And there is our flag. So <laughs> we are good. So let's all pre please rise and together we'll say the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you so much. Um, Tonight, I'd like to introduce Shannon Johnston, who will be giving us um, our, our budget information for our, our public hearing this evening. Thank you, Shannon. Yeah, good evening, Chair Smith, Trustee, Superintendent Hawker. Um, today marks our public, public hearing um, for the fiscal year 2022-23 budget. Before we get into it, um, I just want to do a couple shout outs and big thanks. Um, first to our assistant treasurers and our building principals who track their budgets marvelously and also ensure that our internal controls at the building level um, are in compliance. They deal with tons of transactions plus parent phone calls, sick kids running around, so they are amazing and we are so lucky to have them. Um, second is our departments um, and our department heads who really have taught me their budgets and operations and they have been gracious with their time with sitting down as we go through their budgets. Um, and then lastly, uh, my finance team, they're so strong, so amazing, especially um, Angela Durek, our new accounting manager. She's been exceptional, been right there through the thicket with me learning about the budget. So really want to thank everyone um, for all their time support. It's not just one person, it's a team. So thanks for that. Um, all right, so the agenda to tonight, we're going to um, definitely focus on our big general fund, going through the fund balance, revenues and expenditures for next year. We'll take a little bit of a look at um, all our other funds and then um, a bit of an ESSER update because it'll continue to impact us for the next couple of years, that ESSER funding, and next steps in the budget process. Okay, so we'll start with taking a look at our fund balance. Um, before we start our, actually when we start our budget process, we take a look at um, what our current year fund balance was looking at, looking like surplus deficit and what we were what we're looking at for next year, um, taking account any surplus and deficit um, on an ongoing basis. Um, we won't know our true ending fund balance and our true beginning balance until late August, mid-September as we close the books. Um, we're still waiting on some revenue payments. Um, there's always timing of purchases on the calendar year and then um, also waiting for prop final property tax revenue. So um, we'll be able to report those actuals during um, after September and when the auditors come to present. All right, so around this time last year, we were looking at a pretty significant, significant deficit, um, about a 4.3 million deficit. Um, that was largely due to 
Uh, we've had declining enrollment. Um, the state was going to most likely do a, a PISA free, so public education stabilization fund. Um, they would not contribute to the difference between what they owe, what their allocation is, and what they would actually owe to the schools. Um, right now, as we look through estimated actuals, we're also we're actually experiencing a smaller deficit, which is great news. Um, probably not to an exceed a one million. Um, we'll know the actual actuals in August, um, but that's largely due to no piece of freeze enrollment based funding when our adopted was actually based on ADA. So great help to us, and then um, just savings on the salary side with vacancies. <clears throat> and so for our beginning fund balance for this adopted budget, so next year's fund balance, um, it's not going to change from 21-22. The reason is any deficit will be offset with ESSER. So we still will have some backfill, but not that $4.3 that we are expecting. Okay, now let's take a look at our general fund revenues. Um, we like to display this these pie charts every year. It's a comparison between um, what our adopted 22-23 will be and then what our current 21-22 budget year. Those big blue, um, that big blue teal um, piece of the pie, that is our salary-based apportionment, our benefit-based apportionment, and our unit distribution. So our big state revenues take up the biggest piece, piece of the pie. Um, a big, one big change is um, in 21-22, we had about 5% of our general fund revenues um, from ESSER, so that backfill for our deficit. This upcoming year, we're not going to be needing that deficit, we hope. Um, so ESSER is not budgeted in our general fund this year, so that's a big change. The second big change is, um, sorry, that it's so tiny, but our sa state salaries and units is 63% of our revenues this year. Last year, it was 58%. That's due to that huge increase in the unit distribution to help fund our health insurance. So we have about 6,000 more per support unit um, in our, our unit distribution. So those are some big impacts for the general fund revenues this year. Now our general fund revenues, um, there's two very important metrics that really comprise 70% our, of our revenues. They influence 70% of the revenues. One is support units, and one is our staff mix or our average salary. So we'll go into both of those. <clears throat> so first, our support unit. What is a support unit? Um, it's pretty much a state-derived calculation that takes our average daily attendance divided by a state-determined divisor. Um, you can sometimes think of it as classroom units. I try not, I don't really want to emphasize that because as you see in the next slide, the calculation is a little different and it doesn't really mean an average class size. There's two very significant um, counts or snapshots in time. Um, for our support units. One is called our first reporting period. It's the first 10 weeks of school. So our average daily attendance for those first two weeks divided by those state divisors. The second one is our best 28 weeks. So we literally take our best 28 weeks out of the year and then divide it by um, our divisor again. Um, to illustrate what that calculation actually looks like, so you take your district ADA and your um, programs by grade level, and you divide it by those state-determined support unit divisors. Um, depending on the grade level, there's going to be different divisors. You see the kinder is 40. That's because the state only funds kindergarten um, a half day. Even though there has been a huge leadership increase to fund full day K, they're still keeping at that 40. So it'll be curious to see as the years go on if they do change that divisor. Um, and then so, and then yeah, you'll see elementary is one through three, it's at 20, four through six, 23. So you can literally take our ADA and then divide it by that formula. Okay. So, um, uh, very important piece of the puzzle for our, cur our current year budget is that we're still going to be funded on enrollment-based funding. We were funded on enrollment-based funding for fiscal year 21, this current year, and now they ins instituted a temporary rule again to continue it for fiscal year 23. 
as of the moment, fiscal year 24 is still going to be funded off of average da daily attendance. So if you think of average daily attendance um, in the comparison to enrollment, it's about 24% of enrollment numbers. So if, we, if it was ADA, we'd be funded um, by less ADA, meaning less support units. And I can sh I'll show that to you in a chart as well. Shannon, yeah. the, I believe le legislators this year passed, um, I think, a, a two-year temporary rule on that. Is that correct? And yeah, so it was, it was for this current year to make sure it was in this current year. And then, uh, oh, the, it was the veto, the yes. actual bill. Yes, that was vetoed. And was that to make it permanent or that was to no. do a couple years? Right? The fiscal year 23 and 24. So the temporary rule is only doing fiscal year 23. Shannon, could you repeat what you said, 24%? I, I somehow missed 94%. that. 94%. So ADA average daily attendance, it's roughly 94% of enrollment. Because if you think about it, okay. not every student may, will show up each day um, of the school year. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so I want to show you guys a comparison of our support units um, from last year, so fiscal year 21, and where we were at on our February payment this year. Um, so what we do when we are creating that support unit calculation, we get our enrollment for each of the grade levels, um, then we take that divisor, and then that gives us our support unit. So last year, pretty significant in drop in enrollment from prior years, about at 9,993. Um, luckily, it was enrollment and not ADA, so we got 504 units. Um, this current year, enrollment is, has, is up a little bit, so, um, and we're still being funded off of enrollment for this year. So we um, are getting funding based off of around 512 support units. And here is just showing that comparison from fiscal year 21 to 22. We, our enrollment changed. We actually got a little bit of an increase from that huge decline in, in 21. Um, so the support unit change was 10, 10 support units. Now projecting for, oh, and then a side note is we're still down this current year, 857 um, students enrollment from pre-COVID numbers. So I guess imagine if we were had that those 1920 levels and funded off of enrollment, how much more additional funding we would get. It'd be very significant. Um, and I guess you can relate to other neighboring districts who didn't get that huge enrollment decrease, like Post Falls, Lakeland, and they're funded off enrollment. Those are some big one-time revenues for those districts. So here is our projection for next year. We're pretty. We're holding. Pretty constant, um, steady, a very kind of conservative approach because there's so many unknowns at this time with enrollment. Housing market, um, we'll see what eSchool has to bring us, but we just wanted a very conservative level approach to um, next year's budget. So we are projecting 10,283 for enrollment. So that equates to support units of 514. I did want to show you, though, what it would look like if we were funded off of ADA instead. Um, if you take ADA, it's 94% of enrollment. It would leave us 9,730. You divide it by the divisors. That is only 485 support units. So pretty drastic increase or decrease. <clears throat> um, we'll, so we'll continue throughout the summer when we're getting closer to the school year, be able to give you more accurate enrollment uh, figures and keep you updated with that. Okay, and here's just a trend analysis of what it looks like for the past 10 years. Um, we've had, we had, we're having a, we had a great steady incline in enrollment and then um, you see those COVID marks and that huge decrease um, in in our support units, blue line represents represents the first reporting unit, red line represents the best 28 weeks. So at our budget subcommittee, um, we did recommend that we build the budget based, based off of 514 support units for both metrics, the first reporting and the second reporting. Um, typically, the best 28 weeks would actually be lower 
than and um, than the first reporting period because but because it's an enrollment now and there's so many unknowns we're going to keep it at 514 and see how we come in um, at the end of this school year and then we can um, discuss then what a, be a better best 28 weeks could possibly be and then um, just for kind of when we talk about support units and how much revenue that generates um, for fiscal year 23, one support unit generates about $120,000. So you can always think of that in terms, um, if we are funded off of ADA for next year, rather than enrollment, we're looking about, that would be $3 million less in revenue. And then just kind of quantifying it in terms of a support unit divided by a divisor, you see the state funds more depending on what kind of grade level or alternative school or um, special education. Okay, so we got through the one big metric for revenues. There's also another big metric, which is staffing mix, um, which de determines our salary-based apportionment. It's a pretty complex formula. Um, I just learned it, you know, a couple months ago. So um, I'll try to simplify it, but if you ever have any questions, feel free to, I can walk it, walk through it with you. Um, so pretty much the state bases, bases us off of the average salary. Um, they determine, determine the average salary for instructional and pupil services based off of where they land on the state's career ladder or the state's um, salary schedule, not our salary schedule. For classified, they have a set set average amount, and for administration, they have a set average amount times an admin index number. Um, so the formula, once we determine our average salary, then they the state also determines, based of off, off of our support units, how many staff our staff allowance, how many they, staff members they want to pay us for. So we could actually have a little more staff members in admin, pupil services, instructional, or classified, or we could have a little less, but the state says this is your allowance um, and that's what we'll fund you on. Um, and that is pretty much how you get to the salary-based apportionment. Um, here is a small, sorry, tiny equation that tries to simplify it. We get our supporting units um, times a staff allowance ratio. So the state gives us this ratio. So we times our support units times the ratio, and that is the amount of staff they determine they're going to fund us on. After we have that staff allowance, we times it by those average salaries that the state determines, and that is our revenue. Um, they also give 19.59% in um, benefits, which equates to per C, FICA, and Medicare. Not incl doesn't include any other like. Um, health insurance, life, um, so that's it simplified. Um, and just for a reference for fiscal year 23, um, these are the average salaries that we're being funded on. Administration, we are getting about $76,000. Instructional, about $51,000 per instructional um, staff member. A little less for pupil services because of the staff mix and where they land on the state salary schedule. And then classified is set at 24,841. Um, if you take that and then you look at our salary schedules, we pay much more than what the state is actually funding us. Um, that is important because pass-throughs have been a pretty big discussion for the last couple years um, in negotiations in, in our, um, throughout our district. Um, uh, what this, in the state formula, they give us 3,500 for master education um, premiums, and that is what goes into factoring our average salary of 51,000. Um, they also pay a little more um, in revenue for advanced professional rung. We went into that in depthly last year, um, and what we we settled in bargaining is that we would pay 50% of the difference between a teacher that lands on the state's AP rung versus professional run. So this, just for reference, um, the state's eight advanced professional two, um, the, it generates $54,000. The professional generates $50,000. We determined that difference between 54 and 50. We divided by two and it'd go to passing through. 
meaning it really doesn't, um, it diverts some money from our, the average salary we get. So instead, it, instead of using that overall total increase to fund steps, lanes, um, increase the base if we're looking okay and we're, we're looking fiscally healthy, um, it diverts some of that and it w goes to the specific individuals who are either on AP2 or getting that master's education premium. So we will um, continue to report back um, based off of the continual discussions we have in, um, in negotiations and bargaining. But they're very, um, it's very complex formula, um, but those are some really big ticket items that have been you know, affecting districts throughout the past couple of years. Okay, so summarizing that big, um, it's called the foundation payment, our salary-based apportionment, our unit distribution, um, some transportation. Compared to last budget, adopted budget, we are generating seven million more in revenues. Um, I, if you see that gray column though, there is a caveat because the adopted budget included um, a $1.15 million PISA freeze as well as funded off of ADA. So the second column shows us what we're actually getting this year. Um, so compared to what we're actually getting in the adopted, that's about a $5 million increase in our foundation payment. Um, one of the big increases was to that first line, that unit distribution, about a little more than 6,000 additional for, uh, per support unit to fund um, state insurance, or to fund st health insurance. Um, and the goal from the state to, but with that increase was to get more districts on the state insurance plan. After taking a look at um, our insurance with our insurance committee, we determined that it was better currently right now for the district to stay on our current plan. Um, it's more affordable for our district and there's be the better plans for the employees at this moment. Shannon, did most school districts or where did, where did a lot land maybe? statewide do you have any idea oh i not Sorry. many i think dr hawker um, might have a couple more more insight yeah i'm happy to share what i know um most large school districts are struggling making the transfer they're they're i'm only aware of one that is able to make that transfer right now and that's the nampa school district and that is primarily because they substitute out their bus services and they substitute out their custodial services. So they don't employ any of those people. And, and that savings has apparently justified enough for them to uh, perhaps move to the state insurance plan. But the, the vast majority of the larger districts are, are not able to, to make that move at this time. Great, thank you. I think Nampa runs the state salary schedule as well. I think they're the largest district that uses that. So. Help too. Yeah. All right. So that foundation payment, that's about 70% of our state revenues. Um, we also have other state funding and it has more restrictive ties um, and it's based off of state determined metrics um, of different counts or maybe they'll recommend um, like a per pupil dollar amount each year. Um, there wasn't huge changes to all those special distributions, just a couple. Um, one significant one being that the state is not funding leadership premiums. Um, that isn't in the general fund, so you won't see that here. That was a big topic. Um, and then there is a nice little boost to school facilities lottery um, funding that helps to go fund some school facility expenditures. We this. Fiscal year, we were, we had about 684 in revenue, and it's boosting up to a little more than a million. So a little bit of good news. So in all total um, special payment, general fund special revenue payments are increasing by a little less than 600K. All right, and then the third component of our general fund revenues is local revenues. Um, not huge um, differences. One difference is um, investment earnings. We Interest rates are not as great. And then also we, um, at the start of last fiscal year, our, all our, um, our cash that was in the treasury, we divided that um, up between a couple accounts um, to keep track of the, our bond cash separately. So 
we were earning a little bit more on bond investments in the prior years, but now we're splitting that up per auditor recommendation. So we general funds won't, you know, it's just a general fund cash balance now. And then um, kind of the missing link that we see from last year's budget or this current year fiscal year into next year is that ESSER um, backfill to backfill our deficit. Um, we are showing 4.3 million. Um, our actuals, unknown right now, we, s we know it's significantly less to backfill our deficit, but unknown until we close our books. And then for fiscal year 23, I'm budgeting zero in the general fund for our federal funds. They will be tracked separately and used, um, they won't be used on general fund, current general fund items. Okay, so a nice little summary. The total change in um, revenues is about 3.6 million. That includes though, um, taking out our federal revenues. So if you, if you took out, or if you added back in ESSER, it'd be about a $7.9 million increase to general fund revenues compared to last year's adopted. Okay, so after we put together the revenue components, we take a look at our expenditure com components. Um, they can divide, be divided into two big categories, all our payroll expenditures and then our non-employee related costs. We like to lovingly call them NERCs, so super great trendy accounting word. Um, so taking a look at payroll, um, last year we, it was tough to budget payroll and uh, salaries last year because of COVID. Um, There's tons of vacancies, tons of changes. Um, COVID funding created complications. Um, we were just in a state of constant, constant flux. Um, so this year when we took a look at kind of where we were with estimated actuals in the budget, and we're seeing kind of a lot of variances, we determined we need to go back to basics in how we budget for payroll, meaning what are our current um, positions in our in our system right now um, and then factoring in our known retirees known resignations um, known people on leaves of absences filling those um, typically higher salaries with more rookie salaries and then also adding in um, estimated hourly wages it has been a little difficult to get an average hourly wage um, for all these COVID years so we Took, we went back all the way to 1819 to find a normal hour, hourly wage and kind of just made our best adjustment on how we would, um, how do we factor that in with the loss of staff that we have seen as well. Um, and then we also added in sub costs um, base, and then also increased sub costs um, for our ESS, our admin fee, because our subs are no longer our subs. We contract that out. So there is a little bit of a fee applied to those sub costs. Um, and then added also in like any known stipends that aren't part of department budgets already. And then of course, extracurricular coaching. And that's how you get a payroll budget. All right, so for our non-employee related costs, so these are all our department budgets, all of our building budgets. Um, we have really tried to maintain flat budgets for these last couple of years. Um, if we saw increases in contracts or decreases in contracts, um, the budgets would absorb that, re maintaining the same level. Um, inflation poses a huge uh, complexity to that, that uh, flat budget um, procedure or what we've done. We're seeing crazy increases, um, especially in maintenance operations, tech, special education, you, yet our utilities alone. Um, I think we feel it at the grocery stores on a personal level. We see it at the, the gas pump. So we really could, can't operate with that flat budget as we would like to, um, but we have had to adjust and increase some of our departments. Um, so when we take a look at trying to explain all our expenditure changes, um, let's first focus on just what has happened with our payroll and benefits. Um, for our CERT side, we, I was able to decrease a little bit. Um, everything that you see in red has increased just based off of, you know, going back to basics of what really where, what, are, what current positions we have. Um, 
you've, you'll see that we are breaking out the substitutes now. Um, we're we're tra tracking that a little separately. Um, we have had a, a nice little uh, savings in health, um, but the two main impacts to our uh, payroll budget is um, the huge increase in literacy funding. Now that's housed in a separate fund, but that huge increase was to help us fund full day K. So what we have done with the budget is those kin kinder teachers who have been in the general fund budget who haven't been essentially fully funded by the state, we have transferred those kinder salaries out of the general fund and into the new literacy funding. So that is a cost savings to the general fund, a pretty big cost savings of 1.8 million. Um, also, in addition to that, when I was talking about how we look at known retirees, known resignations, and we, um, we supplement them with either more rookie salaries or more of an average, not on the, that, the lowest, the highest paid um, step in lane. Um, so you will see a savings of a little less than 500K. Um, in the past, it's been a little more, but we're seeing a lot of resignations from um, some of our younger staff. So I think just the, the impact of COVID, um, very stressful times is creating unexpected. Um, it's, you know, we can't really follow trends as much as we could. Okay, so that was based off of current positions. Um, also, when I was talking about inflation, or we also take add-on um, commitments that are not currently in the budget, and we like to show those to you separately. So these are, were, are currently not in our fiscal year 22 budget that are being added to the fiscal year 23 budget. Um, we have a little bit of a cost to meet uh, the minimum career ladder. So you'll see that line item for the next couple years as um, our lowest step on the certificated salary schedule meets up to that career ladder. Um, a big highlighted cost is the increase in health insurance. We're looking at a 9.8% increase in health insurance. Huge impact to the budget. Thankfully, the state gave us 6,000 additional per support unit to help fund health insurance. So um, we really, if we didn't have that, it'd be a drastic impact to the general fund more than it is. Um, you also, we've also added um, our virtual academy additional salaries into those, um, into the budget. Um, we added in a 0.5 assistant principal at Sorensen and a 0.5 assistant principal at Hayden um, to make the assistant principal is now more comparable. Hayden was only operating off of a 0.5 assistant principal, um, so now it's at a one FTE. Um, we continue to see, unfortunately, increases in the work comp insurance, um, and then you'll also see under that a our 50% pass through for our AP. Um, that will be a continued line item, so at 263, and that was bargain last year. So those are the new costs for on the payroll side. We and sorry for the small, very small table. Um, we also added on new commitments for the NERC, so the non-employee related costs. Um, you see a smiley face. Those items are going to be a one uh, one time cost for the year. So we make sure we always track those one time costs and add them back into or take them out of the budget next year. Um, or as we look at what are what funding do we have to make continued changes or new additional bargaining changes, we can also take a look at maybe those aren't uh, those are a one-time impact that won't be a, a multi-year um, issue. So, in all, about one million more in non-employee related costs. Um, that really is because of inflation um, and just looking at what this year's budget was and adjusting for accuracy. Okay, I talked a lot, but this is a nice table that summarizes everything I just said about what our new costs or new revenues are. On the revenue side, at uh, this fiscal year 22 adopted, we had 79 million, excluding ESSER. You add in all the new revenues and now uh, for our fiscal year 23 adopted, we're at about a little more than 87 million in revenues. On the expenditure side, we started with 83.6 million, so you see a deficit of 
um, our changes on our expenditure side are actually pretty decent. So it's only about a little, little less than 500K additional changes in an increase. So that gets us to about 84.1 million in expenditures, leaving a surplus of 3.15 million. Um, and that- This does not include potential negotiations. Yeah, right? this does not include potential negotiations. So- oh. For, um, only for certified or do we have um, our classified folks figured in the budget? No, we do not have them in the adopted budget. Or administrative? No. Yeah, so depending on the outcome of negotiations and then board approval of classified and admin increases, we will bring you the impacts of that in a re revised budget. And we'll continue to show how budget decisions affect the budget um, to maintain you know, that tracking. Okay, and then here it's similar to what a balance sheet looks like or an income statement. You have our total revenues total expenditures, revenues less expenditures, 3.15 million, um, and then our settlement cost is to be determined. Okay, and then just a little caveat, what would cause us to deviate from this budget? Um, this is a working document, just a projection, not a forecast. So if our support units change, that'll affect our budget settlement our negotiations will affect our budget um, so as a working document we try to be as accurate as possible but we'll bring revisions and updates to you as they come and um, it also just uh, a change in the number of unfilled positions it's really going to be um, a huge effort on our part um, just to track position control a little more closely um, and really try to see what kind of savings we get from vacancies and where we're at and how that affects our budget. Because as you know, there's a lot of unfilled vacancies um, because we simply can't hire, so. Okay, so that's the general fund. We also have a lot of other funds. Um, they come with a lot more restrictions there. They encompass federal funds, um, state revenue funds. We got, have our enterprise school plus fund, child nutrition. Um, so it's a terrible graph. There's a lot of information. Um, that huge skyrocketing blue line you see where you don't see a red line, that's um, our ESSER 3. So if you, um, at the time of our adoption, we didn't have, we couldn't get our ESSER funding um, last year into, into the adoption budget. We just were just finding out about actual ESSER amounts then. So you'll see that huge, um, huge difference. Um, you'll see we don't have, we have a big increase in, um, it'll say miscellaneous state funds and that has to do with our literacy increase. Um, but right here, the, the table doesn't show it that great, but here are all our revenues versus fiscal year 22 revenues if you wanna take a look at um, our revenues for all our other funds. So that's the revenue side of our all other funds. And then expenditures as well. Um, you'll see the increase in ESSER 3 expenditure side. Um, when you always take a look at your federal funds, revenues will always equals expenditures. Um, so keep that in mind. Shannon, yep. on the revenue side, the miscellaneous local grants, is that the um, ANOVIA? That is a lot. That is like all our, tons of um, miscellaneous, yes, and then plus tons more. And then we also um, filter our ASB. Sometimes we purchase for our student body accounts um, on a reimbursement basis. So it's kind of, um, it's, it's a net effect, but there's a ton of stuff that goes in there, yeah. Uh, our CDA tribe stuff, some of it will go in there too if it's not housed at the, at the school sites as well. All right. So a quick ESSER update, just because that deficit that we truly were expecting isn't going to be 4.3 million. 
I want to show you kind of the impacts of that on our three-year ESSER plan. Now, this is just, you know, a plan set based off of um, changes in the adopted budget. What we're really going to do is work as an admin team to go back to this plan, um, look at our priorities again, and then bring it to the board again. Um, so it's just, it's a working budget as well, a working document. There's a, a lot of changes with ESSER. Um, it is not a user-friendly table, but I wanted to show you in year two and three, we used to have these avoid disruption and services through balancing operations budget and staff retention, AKA backfilling to um, offset the deficit. We don't have that anymore. We put it at zero. Um, so what we have done as of right now, we have um, taken those amounts and um, put them in deferred maintenance and mitigating COVID, and that's gonna be probably one of our our suggested strategies of what to do with our ESSER funding is um, being able to help out um, our huge deferred maintenance um, need and priority list. So you'll see um, CH, CHS HVAC, we moved it from year one to year two, just a timing difference. So we'll continue to update these plans. Um, year three will be significant. Um, before we didn't have much left over from offsetting our deficit in years one and two. And now, <laughs> and now we get to hopefully boost up our deferred maintenance projects. And Shannon, um, maybe this week after this hearing, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think we can access that on ours. Oh, got it. Okay. You know, and so I think there's a spot, but I, but we haven't been able to see it up close yet. Yeah. So maybe you can make that possible yeah, for Yeah. Yeah. And us. it's just really Thank you. to, um, get it in the adopted budget. Um, it's not finalized or anything, but really just try to show what we could use it for. Perfect. So Thank you. yeah, we'll continue to bring S or updates to you at a different time when it's not all this other budget stuff. Okay. So what are our next steps? And uh, so our priorities and concerns, um, we are seeing um, just a rising concern across all stakeholders of, based off of what we, our salaries, our wages. Um, we're not comp um, competitive with our neighboring districts anymore. So that is a huge concern that we're gonna need to tackle for next year with this budget. Um, deferred maintenance in our safe facilities is a concern in our next, next uh, presentation will address that and of course just inflation rising costs um i hope the adopted budget reflects you know uh, some inflation but we really don't know until we get through next year if it's going to be worse um so those are things we need to keep in mind um how we're going to address these rising costs though um, we are going to continue our budget subcommittee for next year. Uh, we owe it to our stakeholders to identify how we can try to increase salaries for classified and certificated. Um, we'll take a look at, you know, our current priorities, what we're currently spending our uh, funding on, um, and see if there's any way we can transfer anything to help fulfill higher priorities, um, or if it truly is we're topped out with inflation. Um, with flat budgets, and we need to look at alternative revenue sources. So that is it for the budget hearing. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you to our budget subcommittee who spent a lot of hours analyzing the budget and also teaching me things. Um, that input is highly valuable. So I'm here for questions. Good job, Shannon. Oh, thank, thank you. you it makes thank you make it easier to oh, understand a lot of information. <laughs> I have a question, and I might have already asked this, so forgive me. No. The amount of money that we received this year for literacy, that large number, is that going to be ongoing money? Do we know? We sure hope so. Right now it's, course, it's kind of in law, so I think it will be ongoing. Okay. Um, and it we'll see with our actual accounts, um, with like free and reduced, and one of our, I, not ISAT, what's the other one? IRI. 
there you go. Sorry, still learning. Um, we'll see what the actual revenues flow in, and still that that uh, that revenue estimate was suggested by the state. So hopefully, we actually might see a little more because we kept a pretty conservative okay, but it budget. It should continue. Yes, it on. should continue um, unless they change something in law yet again. And my other question, I forgot because I lost my somehow my stuff disappeared on the uh, food services budget uh -huh. is that all federally funded or do we get anything from the state for that yeah it's um we get a state portion and then we also get um we get a little bit for selling um selling like a la carte but a large portion is is federal and um okay. i owe that that breakdown to you okay thank you and we'll be back um, we will charge in again next year for yes. lunches. Yes. Right. Yep. Yeah, uh huh. The, the There's no universal meals. It's been really confusing um, throughout this budget process. If they were going to do universals or meals or not, it looked like they were kind of going to do it based off of a line item, but that was only to continue your universal meals for fiscal year 22. So yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. All right. Shannon, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well, that concludes the budget presentation portion of this meeting. Um, if anyone else would still like to sign in for public comment in the, on the back, that would be great. Um, I forgot to announce that due to the flag situation <laughs> at the beginning. So um, if anyone else would like to um, sign in for public comment, any opportunities? I'd like to give anyone an opportunity for that? All right, seeing none then. Um, let's see here then. We're gonna move in to public comment. Um, Jenny. Jenny. I have a Jenny on our sheet. And, and so Jenny, I'm assuming, Jenny, would you like an opportunity Katie's kind of talking to Jenny right now. Oh. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Um, that will conclude our public comment portion would you like to give public comment sir that'd be terrific yeah did you sign up on a different sheet maybe i don't have the sheet let's we'll give you a chance and we could sign up and then we'd love to have to hear from you so And sir, if you'd like to come over to the podium and you can, there's um, there's a button on there. This is Mr. Bill Green and Jeff will go ahead and help you. And Mr. Green, we'll give you three minutes. All right. Okay. I just, I just have kind of a quick question. I noticed that on the budget, there was a line item for substitutes, teachers that was contracted out. I think to some, they didn't say it in the budget, but I read about somewhere in Ohio. And I'm just wondering what was the reasoning to implement that since there was, according to people that I know who involved in that, had a very, pretty effective substitute scheduling process that was internal. And I think this cost the district something like $40,000. I'm not sure what the number was, but more money than what was being paid before. And it was added to the budget. So I'm looking at ways to decrease the budget, I guess, because of property taxes. For and sure. I'm just wondering if there's what the reasoning was for uh, yeah. hiring that out when it was already being done internally for a lot less money. Yeah, great question. Thank you. And um, Trustee Hawker, 
<laughs> Super, and I'm I'm batting a thousand here. I do not want your jobs. Thank Hawker you very much. Would be um, happy to address that, and that's that's a great question. Thank so you. So, Mr. Green, um, yeah, I'll do my best to give you a quick answer here, and then I'd be happy to visit with you, and I can go into further detail a little bit later. But essentially, here's the. Here was the thought behind this. Um, for the last couple of years, obviously, um, even with COVID and the challenges that we've been having, our substitute fill rates in our district were really low. So we were not filling the vast majority of our substitute positions. So when a teacher would be sick and out or whatever, we would end up having to combine classes or do something unique because we could not find substitutes to come. We were filling about 60-ish percent of our subs, um, substitute vacancies most of the time. So a company presented a opportunity for us that would help us um, get more substitutes into our district. And we felt like that $40,000 investment would be a good investment for our students so that we could have adults in the classroom with them. And so we thought we'd give them a try. Um, they started with us February 1st. So we've only had this second portion of the school year to, to kind of test it. But it has actually, so far, it's worked out very well. In fact, they have been able to grow the substitute pool much larger than we've ever had it. And, and in fact, just a few weeks or so before school got out, we had over a 100 substitute requests for teachers to leave um, on a Friday or Monday. I forget which day it was, but they, uh, we had actually never been able to really place 100 substitutes in our, in our classrooms previously. And, and we were able to through this um, service from a, a company called the ESS. So, so for, for right now, we're just we're, we're primarily still piloting, piloting it. Um, we're looking forward to a full school year next year so we can evaluate its, its benefits. But for a, uh, a twenty to $40,000 expense to the district to be able to, to grow our substitute pool and have so many, have, have additional substitutes, that was a big plus. And then one other perk is since that this is a private company instead of a school district, the school School district only processed payroll for substitutes once a month. This company pays our substitutes once a week. And so we heard from our substitutes that they really liked the fact that they could get paid more quickly um, for doing the work that they were doing. And the company offers some bonuses and some things for the for the substitutes. So um, that's that's a, a, a brief highlight of, of the reasonings. And I would certainly be happy to visit with you at a, another time if you'd like further details. Can I ask just one more question? about that i forgot uh, that do the substitute teachers have to pay something to this company for signing up and all those different things that go back and forth be no them? no to my knowledge no there's an app an app that is the same app it's it's very close to the same system that we used only their uh that's what they do for a business is recruit um substitutes and and fill in temporary employee kinds of positions and so they're really good at it we have a we have a very good hr department um human re relations department but we have lots of things to do in the district with 1500 employees of course and so um being able to free up a little bit of time was a, a big plus so it's so far things have been working out very well for the substitute that at least that's the reports i've been receiving and we're we're looking forward to completing a full year pilot with them next year to really see what the end results are so as far as you know, the substitute teachers are not having to pay any kind of fee correct. to be in this process. That is correct. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Green. All right. Well, that concludes the public hearing portion of our meeting agenda, and we'll move on. Next up, we have um, consideration of action items, and we could approve, deny, amend, modify, or postpone um, any of the action items listed below. want to invite up um, a presentation. Um, on our on our school plant facilities levy, and Mr. Voller is going to present. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Chairman Smith, Trustees, uh, Dr. Hawker. Um, thank you for having us. Um, at the last regular board meeting, um, Dr. Hawker started a conversation about the consideration of a school plant facility levy, and we are here. We're going to tag team tonight and uh, give you a little bit more information and some background of why we think this would be a good idea for consideration. Um, so we're going to have Seth, I will start, and then we'll have Seth Denniston, Director of Safety and Technology, come up and present a little bit, and then uh, Shan Johnson will come up and present as well. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about, uh, our I'm going to give you a deferred maintenance summary. As I mentioned, uh, Seth Denniston will come up and give a safety and security project update. And Shannon Johnson will talk about the levy rates and market value comparisons, and then we will provide you with a recommendation. 
Um, deferred maintenance, so if you recall back a couple months ago, we actually had a very robust presentation by um, a representative from Amoresco. Um, it's a tracking agency that we use to help uh, manage our deferred maintenance and track all of the needs in the district. So I'm not going to go into great depth on this, but I'm going to spend a couple minutes just to provide a summary. Um, so in this district, we have 41 buildings. That includes our schools, um, our district support buildings, and our portable classrooms. Um, that totals 1.4 million of gross square foot of buildings that we maintain. And we have an average age of our buildings of 33 years. Um, those buildings, the, the square footage that we have, has a current replacement value of 346 million. So if a fire wiped out every building that we have, not including the property, that would take us $346 million to rebuild all of our structures. Currently, we fund the maintenance on our buildings at less than 0.02% um, of the cost replacement value. The industry standard should be 2%. So 2% of that $346 million would be $7 million. Um, so currently, we are well underfunding our deferred maintenance. <clears throat> um, going back to the 33-year age, if you think about the school district and, and the trajectory of it, we have a third of our portfolio that is currently in that 25 to 30-year range. Uh, Hayden Meadows, Fernand, Lake City High School, Woodland Middle School, Skyway, and Atlas were all built between 1991 and 2005. So that's one third of our school portfolio that's in that 33 year age. Many of those schools have not had much done to it. And so we have a lot of things coming due on that list, plus older schools that have had some updates that have things on that list. And so that list is getting fairly large on us as was presented in that Amoresco presentation. This is a slide directly from that Amoresco presentation. Um, the bar on the left is our current year, and it says we have $25.3 million in current needs in our total backlog. Um, and if you recall our funding, generally we fund about $500,000 a year from our general maintenance fund, and we've been subsidizing that with about a million dollars in bond funding on average for about the last 10 years. Um, so it shows that we've been funding about 1.5 million a year, um, but out of our operating, I think it's important to remember that we fund about $500,000 of that right now. And then that additional million dollars um, really is kind of, that pool currently has, dr has dried up for us because we've spent all our bond funds down. <clears throat> Uh, this graph just shows that if you look on that left, the thing I want to point out here is that in our high priority, we have $21 million of that 25 that is high and $500,000 in urgent. So you have a, almost $22 million in a really high category. And that's, I really would say as I look at that, that's based on that 30 to 30 year age of many of our school buildings. Uh, this graph is a little bit soft on this screen, um, but it's basically showing you what our projected liability is growing. So currently at that $25 million on the left, um, in about five years, it grows to $67 million. And actually, I see when I copied this slide over, some of that dropped off. Um, but that, that first line that goes vertical is $67 million. And then the next line um, is 10 years, and that, that goes up to 100 million. So you can see if we don't do anything right now, it's really going to double about every five years as we move on with our total liability of, of upcoming needs. Oh, there they come. I just had to hit the button. <clears throat> Um, this is just a slide to remind you what we call the FCI score. That is a facility condition index. That is a rating that actually I learned when Amoresco was presenting that was designed by the government um, for um, assessing military bases, and I did not know that prior to that. But it is something that we've used in schools to track the condition of our schools. Um, and currently we are in pretty good shape. We are at about a five FCI, and I'll get into that in just a minute. Um, but in that, we're in that fair range. Um, and so just a reminder of that as we go through, because you're going to see reference that FCI score. Uh, this, again, is a slide directly from that Amoresco presentation. But, you know, our FCI score currently right now is 5.8. So we are in the fair category, which is a good place for us to be. Um, I will note that we were previously, when we started this project with Amoresco, we were at 3.9%, and with the funding, the little bit of funding that we've put in over the last couple of years, um, it has grown on us to about 5.8%. Jeff, would you just remind them what the colors mean so they know which one is the fair? Yeah, uh, fair is yellow. Um, 
And then, it, uh, let's see here. I can't even see this on mine. Um, yeah, so we've got, we've got fair and then poor, and then red is critical. So, and green is, green is good. We actually were in green when we started, so now we've just started to migrate up into the fair. And fair is a good place to be. We're fine, we're comfortable being there. That's not a bad place to be. Um, but we wanna stay, when we go into that poor range, when we get into that orange, that's where we go above that 10% threshold that is our target of where we would like to be with our schools. <clears throat> We had Amoresco, um, so it, when we plugged all the data in to maintain that 10% FCI, they suggested that we need an additional 6.1 million in annual funding. So that's a 6.1 million in addition to the 1.5 that we suggest that we already currently fund. And so again, that's a 1 million from bonds that we've done from past, 500,000 from annual. Um, and so I had them run some scenarios, if you recall, and they showed us the graph line of what it would look like if we infuse $7. million into our funding scenario. And so you can see the line that goes up, that dark line, um, is basically our current projection with, with the funding that we currently have. And you can see if we put $7 million into capital funding, we're, just, we're basically bouncing right along that green line in the fair as we move along. If we fund $5 million, you can see we start to rise up a little bit quicker, um, it, but we're still in that fair category for a 10-year cycle. Um, and so that keeps us in that fair cycle um, and keeps us in a place where we can manage and sustain. I had them look at what it would look like with a $3 million. You can see we start to rise pretty quickly up into that poor category. Um, that's about five years, four and a half years that we end up into that poor category if we maintain our current funding. And at 1.5 million, you can see we drop pretty quickly. And at, at $500,000, which is basically what we'd be funding right now if we continue to move forward, um, you know, we'd jump up really quickly into that. I downloaded a report to say, okay, of that $25 million, what does that look like for us? You know, what are our big needs? Of that, our HVAC systems comprise seven and a half million dollars. Um, a couple examples, the Lake City High School has 115 heat pumps in it. All of those at 30 years old are due for a replacement or at the end of their life cycle. We run the risk of, you know, shutting down classrooms if those go out. Um, the good part about that is if one goes out, it's one classroom that is down. We can replace those as we go along. But you start to look at that, and those, you know, those are some pretty big ticket items. Um, Coeur d'Alene High School, while we are addressing the 700 building with the HVAC system, their 300 wing and their 100 wing are both currently due. Um, Ramsey, Hayden Meadows, Woodland all have 30 or 40 heat pumps each in those. So that's just kind of a sampling of what makes up some of that $7.5 million of HVAC systems. Um, there's over 900 HVAC systems in this district, by the way. <clears throat> um, asphalt repairs, I put those on there. Um, Lake City High School has a lot of potholes. We'll be replacing those, um, we'll be filling those potholes in over the summer um, just to maintain, but there's some pretty big sections of that parking lot that are starting to crumble and could very well be gravel by the time we actually replace the asphalt on those. Um, Ramsey, uh, the bus loop is the same way. Roofs, Atlas, Skyway, Fernand, Woodland, um, Coeur d'Alene High School, uh, and a couple others make up $4.5 million in roof needs. Water heaters, there's 45 water heaters that are currently due across the district um, at a cost of about $235,000 total. Floor finishes and carpet, um, think about Woodland Middle School, for example, if you've walked through there, all of those hallways are carpet. Um, they're starting to fray, they're starting to bubble, they're starting to wear um, because we have 900 students that walk that carpet every day and, um, and that's 1.7 is the total for floor finishes. I'm just pointing out Woodland is one of the examples in that. Jeff, uh, would that yep. be to replace carpet or to remove the carpet and go to polish concrete? That would be to replace carpet. It would be a little more expensive to go to polish concrete. Um, so that would, that would be this um, program that we use is basically replacing like for like. I mean, we could certainly consider, and we've talked right. about the need for that. I know with some of the bond projects, and, yep, right, it, yep. it's more expensive up front, right? But the 
right the maintenance cost the maintenance over quite a bit over less. the term of over it time. and um, the durability of it certainly would be um, something that we may want to consider for that uh, boilers and plumbing fixtures, again, uh, Coeur d'Alene High School uh, would be good to update really all of the plumbing fixtures to low flow plumbing fixtures. That would save the district costs in going to low flow plumbing fixtures. We've updated some schools, but Coeur d'Alene High School has not. Canfield Middle School has a boiler that is in need of replacing. Uh, Fernand Middle School, or Fernand Elementary also has a boiler that needs to be replaced. Um, the next couple, while not significantly huge line items, I put them on there because I think they're important of you know, thinking about impact to a school. Um, we have a couple trash compactors that are in urgent need of replacement. Skyway fire suppression system. Um, I can give an example. We were out there on Christmas Eve this last year because the fire suppression system blew. The lines are uh, wearing out and rusting, and when they go, they go. And so we ended up being out there on Christmas Eve um, cleaning up the mess from that fire system going down. Um, plus also, obviously, that's a safety issue for the district to address. Um, and Ramsey Elementary has coolers and free freezers that have been giving us problems and are in immediate need of repair. So I put this list together just to give you guys some examples of what some of those needs are that make up that $25 million in our current backlog of needs. Um, other needs, I, I'm gonna throw this out here. Um, you know, with that pot of money, if we were cons to consider this SPFL um, infrastructure, you know, we own the 40 acres currently that is um, on the Prairie and Hutter, kind of in that corner. I think you guys know roughly where that is. Right now, that's the middle of farmland. We know infrastructure needs to come into that site for it to be buildable. Um, developers own most of that property around us, and we've been asked a couple times to consider participating in bringing in the infrastructure for that. So that would include sewer, water, and roads that are going to be necessary for that to be a developable and buildable um, property for us to do something in the future with. Um, so if we had some funds available, we could draw on that to participate in infrastructure. Um, same thing with the Lakeside Capital properties that we are in consideration with. They have expressed that we would need to participate in some infrastructure for those properties as development goes in around those areas as well. And then safety and security is another line item that we can use for this project. And I'm going to bring Seth up to the podium and he's going to go through our safety and security. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. So for the last couple of years, we've updated our safety and security projects as part of the long range plan. And so you've hopefully seen uh, some of these already. Um, we've identified about $5 million uh, to occur over the next three to five years. And so uh, a lot of these include equi uh, equipment that was purchased via the 2012 bond that we just have not had uh, the capital to be able to come back to. And so Right now, we've got about $78,000 of projects that are uh, currently in progress. Um, we've also, over the last few years, just through a variety of sources, uh, we've been able to do a number of different projects. So uh, we've been able to remodel some of the entrances at our secondary schools. Uh, we also did a few safety and security upgrades here as well as at the district office. And so um, this list was generated over uh, a period of time by a small committee. We also have worked with our law enforcement partners and some other partners to, to vet this list. Um, and then it became part of the long range plan. Of course, more recently, many of these have, have become uh, high priority uh, projects for, for people in our community. And so on here, you've got things like replacing uh, door hardware and controllers, uh, security cameras. Those are projects that were done with that bond in 2013. Additionally, there's other projects we'd love to do, like um, adding uh, window security film to all of our entrances at our schools, just making it harder to get in uh, through any of our windows. And then we've got some of our elementaries where we'd like to remodel the entrances and, and have a true vestibule, you know, with a, a bank uh, glass into the vestibule. There's a few schools that don't have that yet. Additionally, as kind of priority two uh, projects that we've identified for safety and security, things like adding access control for portable uh, classrooms. So we've got quite a few portable classrooms at a bunch of different buildings. We'd like to add the same access control we have uh, to our main buildings, to our portables. And then vape sensors, unfortunately, this is uh, an, an issue that just keeps coming up. You've probably heard about it from, from some of our schools. Um, this year, we've been testing out some vape sensors at, at Lakes Middle School and um, some of our other middle schools especially, and they seem to have really helped. So 
um, that'll alert an administrator or somebody in the office when when a vape goes off in a bathroom or a locker room. Uh, kids do find out about that pretty quickly and then they let their friends know. So it's good for a, a little bit of time and then we will end up moving them around the school as needed. Another medium pro uh, priority project uh, for us is just to raise our fence heights. So we do have some schools that have lower fences. We'd like to raise those to six to eight feet. Additionally, we have quite a few locations where our schools are on main streets. And so we'd like to add privacy slats to all those fences. Just kind of, you see that if you drive by uh, Nexa ever, they do have privacy slats on their fences and it does help a little bit. Um, another project that we would love to do is just to add audible door alarms. So anytime a door is propped, has an annoying little beep to it. So until the doors close, it just keeps going off. Um, that's kind of an, an additional thing. And then for priority three projects, these are a little bit longer term ones. Um, one that we have on there is just adding some additional security cameras uh, across the district. You know, we get requests uh, all the time to add additional security cameras. Uh, to give you just some idea, our discretionary security budget for the district is only about 100,000. And so most of what we're doing right now is just maintenance and replacing things as it breaks. Um, like I said, much of this was funded with the 2013 bond and we just haven't been able to replace a lot of, of these things. Um, additional uh, priority three projects that we have on the list, uh, IP speaker clocks for all of our classrooms. We do have those in any of our buildings that have been remodeled in the last couple years. But one of the things that adds is the ability to uh, have scrolling messages to classrooms in case of emergency, as well as different colored flashing lights. And so that adds just another layer of notification other than just sound, right? And then the last one, um, is adding uh, security film to all of our ground floor windows. And so um, that's kind of a, an adjustment to, you know, you can add even tinting and stuff, but it, it just makes the, the glass much harder to break through and much harder to enter uh, buildings through, through a broken window. So that's kind of an, an exhaustive list that we've broken down. Like I said, it's about uh, $5 million and it's broken into uh, those kind of high priority categories uh, medium priority and then low priority. Uh, but like I said, about $5 million total. Um, as we're talking about a school plant facilities levy, uh, you know, typically those are like 10 years. And so many of these projects we would be working to do right away. And then some of them we would probably come back around and do again. So like if you're talking about security cameras, most of those probably have a lifespan of five to seven years or so. And so then you'd get into a replacement cycle like we do with most of our other technology where you'd be replacing uh, them on a regular basis. But like I said, we just have not been able to do that uh, with the funding we have currently. And so I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Shannon who's gonna talk a little bit about levy rate and uh, market value comparisons. All right, thanks Seth. Um, before we get into our own um, district specific rates and scenarios, I wanted to just give a little reminder of how a levy-based tax system works. Um, so Idaho is on a levy-based tax system. Um, it is not a rate-based system like other states um, use. So it's a common misconception that the property value and the property tax have a direct and proportional relationship, AKA a rate-based system where you times property tax times the rate equals the property tax. Um, in a levy-based system, we're looking at, like a, a, at a two-step calculation. You take your levy amount divided by your taxable assessed value, which gives you the levy rate. Then you times that levy rate by the property value. So um, here's the, the step calculation. Levy amount divided by property value equals levy rate. Go down levy rate times property value equals property tax. So in any uh, formula, if you keep the numerator constant, but increase the denominator, AKA e increasing the taxable assessed value, it produces a lower rate. Um, and then these graphics, um, I have to give credit to the assessor for them. Um, they had a really great little um, 
link on their website that explains and breaks down a levy-based system. So I wanted to go through two pretty simple calculations before we get started into our tax rate. Um, the first example is we take six properties. They're all assessed at the same value of 200,000. Everyone gets the same homeowner's exemption. Um, it's currently 125, the assessor had 100, the prior um, exemption online. So that results in everyone has the taxable value of 100,000. Now the district they're in, they determine their levy rate is 9,270. So you take the levy rate, 9,270, divided by the taxable base, which is 600, because you have six homes, times 100,000. So that gives you a levy rate of $1.54 per thousand. So that means that your tax per property is 1,545. Everyone pays the same amount because their assessed value is the same. Two things. Mm -hmm. I think the 100,000 is you get 125 up to 50%. So in this example where the houses are only $200,000, you only get 50%. So oh, okay. that's why it's $100,000. All right, so, thank you. Um, and then the other thing I'd like to just point out mm -hmm. on this example here is unlike every other taxing district, we do not get 3% automatically or even the option to increase our budget 3%. Um, any tax increase that we do is voter approved. We're the only taxing district that yep. operates that way. And Okay. I, I believe oh. the homeowner's exemption is no higher than 125000 yep. Yeah, correct. Okay. So this was an example when everyone's assessed value was the same. Example two shakes things up a bit. Um, two of our homes become um, just rental properties, so there's no homeowner's exemption. Um, property five it has a bigger roof. They had a nice little add-on, which increased their assessed value by 50,000. And then um, property six burned down. So their uh, lot is the assessed value only. There's, there's no other additional building to assess. So that shakes things up a bit. The taxing district, they are still keeping the same levy amount. However, assessed values have changed. Um, property one and two, their taxable value is more because there's no homeowner's exemption. Um, same with property five, they've increased assessed value. So what you do is you take the, the tax base, so that's now at, let's see, 800 because assessed value has increased. You divide, or, and then levy divided by that. So there's a new tax levy rate actually a, a little bit less because they kept the same levy amount but they increased the denominator and now each property has a little bit of um, a change property one two five they have an increased property tax but you see property three and four now their property tax is less they are originally paying one thousand five hundred forty five now they're paying 1,158. Total tax collected is the same because the district didn't increase the levy based off of that assessed value. So that's just kind of how the levy-based system works. Okay, now we'll get into our actual rates. So these are, this is a historical um, rate trend for our own school district from 2015. Um, you'll see our our levy rate has slowly declined. Um, we've been pretty intentional as the assessed values have increased. We have tried to even lower the tax rate. So you'll see in 2022, our current tax rate is $1.56 um, per 1,000. Um, for 2023, I'll go into those a little later. Um, we are looking at about a 0.99 tax rate because I think you've all hopefully gotten your assessed values by now. There's a huge growth, huge growth in assessed value. The assessor's office um, gave, the, gave me the preliminary amounts of 60%. 
So that is, this encompasses all of our levies. We have three current levies. Um, one, the first levy, of course, the blue, is our big supplemental of 20 million. The red indicates our bond levy. Now, we don't have any more available bond funds for construction. This bond levy is to levy the, the principal and interest um, for, for the debt payments. So that's done every year. Um, and then we have a tiny little tort levy to help pay uh, the property and liability insurance. OK. And then here is a comparison. Um, Eric Herringer from Piper Sandler, he shows this in his presentations too, um, of where we're at based off of um, from other districts. The statewide average right now for, for levies is, let me see, it's at $2.46 per 1,000. We are currently at 1.56. I added little arrows just to show you kind of our, our biggest neighboring districts, Post Falls and Lakeland, where, that, where they're at on the, um, the tax rate right now. And that's for this current year. Um, and then just here is some information. Interesting to see how, based off of our enrollment, um, what each district's levy rate is. Okay, so keeping what we had in the earlier slides of the samples of how assessed value changes the tax rate. Um, so when the market value increases and the total levy remains flat, uh, the levy rate drops. Does this mean my tax bill drops? It depends. It depends on what your new assessed value is. Um, I just went on realtor.com and looked at, took a chart of the housing market and saw what assessed value, values were uh, January 1st of 2020, January 1st, 2021, January 1st, 2022, and what it currently the most up-to-date as of April. Um, it's, it's small. We will have these slides posted on the website under the board agenda for you guys to review and for the public to review and have it blown up a little more. Um, but for tax year 2020, home value was 420. Um, taxable value after the homeowner's exemption was 320. Um, and then multiply, multiplied by that year's tax rate, they were paying 572.80. Now, if you go into 2022 um, with a, no SPFL, so what our current levies are projected for next year at a, a point, point 0.98, um, or a, yeah, point 0.98 per 1,000, they're, um, they are still going to have a tax bill of $679.31, which is more from 2020, but their taxable value went from 320 to 690. So it all depends on what your new assessed value will be. Shannon, is this a median home value? What what is this number? Yeah, it the... is a sample, a median home value median, for a zip code okay. 83814. Okay. Can I ask a question just yep. on, so they've just finished um, sending out assessment notices, and so now they're doing all those tax calculations, or they will mm -hmm. next month, right? Because yep. we're all setting our rates in June mm -hmm. um, for our levy amounts. Um, so if we run an SPFL in August, mm -hmm. It wouldn't go into effect until the following tax years on your tax bill. Is that correct? Yeah. So unfortunately, with the August one, it's still going to use the 2020, the fiscal year 2022 taxable amount, which is January 1st, 2021. Um, so with an August election, we would get our first payment in January of 2023. So it's still going to be in the 22-23 year. Um, and with the ballot, it would have to use our current 2022 tax rate. It is. I was thinking it wouldn't, they wouldn't levy those first mon uh, money until July of 2023. Yeah, no, it's, it's January will be the first partial paint, par partial revenue to the school. Because we pay, we pay December and June, right? Or December and June? Mm -hmm. 
So December is the first payment, June's the second payment, and we're paying in the arrears as consumers, right? So in December we're paying this in June we'll be paying this year's tax bill. So right now we just paid the twenty one second half mm -hmm. of twenty one tax yep. bill. But they won't re levy until July of twenty twenty three. So I don't think we'll we wouldn't get money until December of twenty twenty three and June of twenty twenty four. Okay, on well, this levy, I think. All right. Well, uh, I emailed with Eric Carringer, so I'll forward that to you, and then we can um, confirm with him. Okay. Okay. And then here is just how I was talking about how the districts tried to make a commitment as assessed value goes up. So blue line is assessed value. Red line is actually our drop in our tax rate. Um, so you'll see as assessed value goes up, the drop in our tax rate is going up as well. Okay, so we are gonna present uh, four different scenarios. Um, scenario A being what next year would look like without any SPFL, and then B, C, and D are options for the different amounts that we could possibly go for. Um, we'll, I'll have this on each slide, but just take note, um, our current taxable value for 2022 is at 15, almost 16 million. You times that by a 60% growth rate um, preliminary from the assessor, and that gives you a new taxable um, tax value of 25.6 million. Okay, so for scenario A, we have our supplemental levy, still 20 million, our bond levy of 5 million, that's for the debt service and principal for our 2012 and 2017 bonds, our tort levy, no plant, plant levy, so we are levying a total of 25.2 million. So if you take that 25.2 million, you divide it by, I showed what, you, what would be if you divide it by our current tax value right now, and what next year's would look like with a 60% growth rate. We're at 1.58, so two cents more than our current tax rate, or we're at 0.98 with that 60% growth rate. Now how that affects different assessed homes. So let's say we have three different homes. Um, one's 450,000, one's 650, one's 950. You take the, away the homeowners, you take out the homeowners exemption, and then the current taxable tax tax on that home is um, for the 450, it's 512, 827, and 1300. Um, that's using that 1.58. If you use the 0.98, so that's the current levy amount divided by the taxable assessed value at 60% growth rate. Um, you'll see those those uh, tax amounts are lower because the denominator increased so much and you kept that numerator fixed. This is if your house was assessed at 450 last year and also is assessed at 450 this year. Correct? This doesn't take account to what your home was assessed at at all. It just shows what your home would be with a, a $1.58 per thousand rate or a 0.98%. Okay, so we're increasing the total assessed value, but but this is no increase in individual assessed value. Yeah, yeah. If you want to see how it would have affected an individual person as their assessed value increased, you can go to this one to see how it would. Okay, scenario B. We included a $7 million plant levy. So you can see now levy total increased, and we're gonna look at those two um, assessed value amounts. With our current assessed value in 2022, that increases the projected rate to $2.01. Using the new growth rate that the assessor has given, that's $1.26 um, next year. So again, it shows you same, uh, those th same three homes, what the cost would look like with those. So 
Sorry, I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, so the current annual S SD-271 cost, that does not include a plant levy? No, no. This, um, it does include the $7 million plant levy. So what I'm trying to do with those, the current versus the projected, is show the comparison of how our increase in assessed value affects those tax amounts. So, um, so this is th using this year's numbers as if we had had a plan. Level. Correct. Okay. So, and then if you want to refer to compare this one with with no levy, then you can start comparing and seeing the difference. Um, so hopefully you get the, the gist. Scenario C is now increasing the plant levy to $8 million. Um, So the projected rate using current known assessed value, it goes from 2.1 to 2.8. Um, using next year's assessed value, it goes from 1.26 to 1.30, so a $4, 4, 4 cent difference. And then scenario D is a $9 million um, plant levy per year. And then so you can start seeing the increase in the cents. Shannon, mm -hmm. I'm confused, I guess, okay. on this slide, how you're getting the current column, the second column, or third column, I guess it'd be. So if we're looking at the $450,000 assessed value yep. column, the current cost is, I think it says six ninety five. dollars um, and then the projected with a 60% increase is 434. Can you say that again, Casey? So the, maybe I'm reading it wrong. So each row is a oh. house. She, but see, so she's increased. Right. So it's 450. Yep. And you're saying currently, and I assume currently is this year. So that as current if we had had is if million. we had if we had a plant levy what it would have looked like this in this year. This is not actually our current. With, with this year's taxable value, assessed value, not including that 60% growth. So I am taking... So, yeah, that's where I'm getting confused is because that column says you, your tax bill is going down, but I don't understand how the tax bill could be well, going down. Because the total assessed value has increased, but that's assuming the assessed value of your individual house has not increased. So I've got three houses. So let's take a look at four, the 450, right? We take out the exemption, so that's 325. 325 using the $2.14, that, the current, that current cost would be 695 in taxes. If we take the the one dollar and thirty four cents instead, your tax bill is four hundred and thirty four dollars. So I, I guess where I, where it's confusing yeah. to me is because that says with sixty percent increase in assessed value, but you're not increasing the assessed value sixty percent of the individual house of the individual oh, house. Right. But so we know the, yeah. on average the homes went up 60%. Like, like I just calculated my house, and I had, unfortunately, higher than 60% yeah. increase on my own house. Um, so, so using the, the rates, I changed about $24. You know, not a ton of money. Yeah. Doing I'm, nothing. I'm but. not com trying to compare this year with next year. I'm showing how tax, the tax assessed value changes. So let's say we weren't in a booming you know, economy with our home prices and they assess value remains pretty flat. So an in adding on a tax levy increases that tax rate, but because our market value is increasing so much, how it would affect the tax rate, the levy rate after that. So this isn't a comparison from f fiscal year to fiscal year. That this is a, that is a comparison of how it affects. So I'm just showing currently what a 450 home would be next year or if your home's 650,000 next year for your assessed value those are how the rates would be affected but you're saying our tax our levy rate our individual cost as a taxpayer is going to go down is that what you're saying no it depends if, on if your, your value didn't value. go up it wouldn't right. Right. everyone's value oh, right. yeah. <laughs> 
Right. That's why I'm kind of, you're going to give us all these, right? Yeah. So we can yeah. spend some time in them. Yeah. So this, if you want to yeah. see how year to year can, it can will you just pause here affect the tax bill. Can you, can you pause here for a second? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. And this would be looking at two assessed values for next year. If we pretended we had no growth for our assessed value, how that would how would how that would affect a tax rate. And if we had a big growth like 60%, how that would affect a tax rate. Assuming your assessed values are these amounts for next year. Okay, so, but what this does tell us is if you have a $450,000 assessed value like you got, your letter said $450,000 yep. um, with this is with a $7 million plant levy. Yes. Your taxed, total tax cost for 271 would be $409? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Go diagonal, they can see what it would be with a $200,000 increase. Oh, that's a good, do you want to? Sure. You tell them that creative logic. So one, one thing that I just noticed, and let me see if I can get a laser pointer here. So if you go diagonal, you can actually see with the $200,000 assessed value increase, what the tax bill difference would be. So if your current assessed value is 450,000 and your current tax bill is $654, if your assessed value went up to 650,000, next year it would be $661. So that would be a net increase of about $7. So that, that just shows you you know, even with a $200,000 increase in assessed value, it shows you that the tax bill is gonna be relatively negligible. I think what Shannon's trying to show here is the difference in the projected rates. And so uh, at the outset, she was kind of trying to explain the difference between a levy and then a rate-based levy like we do. And so as the, the market value gets bigger, each person's share actually goes down a little bit. And so that explains why our projected rate is going to go from $2.01 down to $1.26 next year. So the tax rate will just continue to drop uh, even if, if we add an SPFL. Because the base is expanding. Correct. Okay. Yeah. That's what yep. I needed. Yay. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, so if we do that move diagonally, yeah. that's approximately a 45% increase in your assessed value if we, that diagonal is FYI. <laughs> okay. So same with scenario D, how 9 million looks. All right. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Hawker for a district recommendation. Or Seth, was that you? Either way, okay. So as we looked at this, we looked at a, a bunch of different options. Um, and so just to be clear, when we talk about an SPFL, that's a school plant facilities levy. Uh, it is a funding mechanism relatively unique to Idaho. Uh, school plant facilities levies can only be used for capital projects. So it's similar to a bond in, in that perspective. It can't be used for, for people or programs. It's, it's specifically meant for uh, things like, like facilities projects. And so we're recommending an $8 million a year uh, school plant facilities levy for 10 years to fund the safety and security projects that I mentioned, as well as all of those deferred maintenance needs. Uh, part of the reason why we're recommending $8 million a year is because of inflation. And so as we talked to Eric Carringer and others, they recommended an inflation rate of about 5%. We know we're way over that right now. 
but our plan would be to spend actually less than $8 million the first few years. So as we're looking at that growing list of deferred maintenance needs, we would be spending less than that, planning to spend more than that later on because we know that the, that the value of our dollars is going to continue to shrink with inflation. And so that's how we landed on that, uh, that $8 million a year. We also were looking at the deferred maintenance graphs and trying to keep us in that, that manageable range. And one way that um, we've been talking about the total value of all of our properties being $345 million across the district, you know, if you're a typical homeowner, and you're spending about $7,000 a year on your $345,000 house, that makes sense, right? You might have to replace a water heater, a dishwasher, you know, one year might be a roof or you might have to paint. That's kind of how we're looking at the deferred maintenance needs that, that we need to keep up with those if we want to maintain the, the value uh, and the investment that our communities made in all of our buildings. And Dr. Hawker, I don't know if you have more to add to that. No, other than just to reiterate, um at our last meeting, I just kind of showed you your uh, timeline. Um, if this is something that you're interested in doing and putting on a ballot for the uh, August 30th, I believe is the date election, that's that that uh, resolution and and the wording um, is all due to our our uh, county tax folks by July 11th, I believe, which happens to be the exact same day as your July board meeting, and so sometime either tonight um, or prior to that date, um, if it's your pleasure, we would need to have that um, approved formally so that we can get it to the, to the, the, to the powers to be to get it on the ballot. Um, it is an aggressive you know, timeline. We, I, I would say that when we, um, we have a member of our long range planning committee right here as well, when we worked this whole year with that committee, I think, uh, we didn't really talk about a, an August date. Um, I think we were really kind of targeting a March timeline along with the, uh, um, the regular M and O levy that we will have to, to ask. Um, but upon, um, conclusion of the work from the long range planning committee and, uh, just, just recognizing that there are, there are, you know, roughly $5 million of, of safety and security, um, things that we would like to address much sooner than later. We, we just made the recommendation that we feel the time is, is now to ask our community um, at the end of this summer to support the, this portion of, of this need. And then um, hopefully they get behind that. And then we will we'll go to work in the fall with uh, continuing to educate our community on the, the needs of a, of a maintenance and operation continued levy that we, that we rely upon so much. So we, we just feel like there's there's several things we could put into place right now if we had those dollars this next year um, just to help shore up our, our safety and security components within our school um, a little bit better. And you've all you've all received some some communications in the last few weeks um, with a, a heightened a heightened sense of, of concern with, with school security. I would say that we, we feel very good with what we have. But there are some things that we have always placed down on a, a little lower of a priority level because of funds. And I think this could be an opportunity that we could move those up to a higher level priority and, and go ahead and, and start getting them addressed um, much sooner than waiting until March of next year to, uh, to, to get that going. Can I, I just ask a question about the item. So currently in our m and we fund a number of capital items, school buses, curriculum uh, materials, those sorts of things. Are you, would your plan be to shift any of that out of the m and over to the plants facility or would it be to keep that in the m and I think there are, there are some things. Um, we've not had the time, honestly, to really detail all of that out. I think there are some things that we, can, we could make that switch. Um, I think you heard from, from Jeff tonight that we, we do generally have $100,000 or so of things out of our regular, um, regular budget that we, we, we plan for. You heard Seth say we have about $100,000 or so of discretionary tech things that, that we fund out of our regular budget. So I think there are some components that we could we could easily move out if this were to get supported and, and, and pass, that would be a huge plus. I, I do think too, as we, as we just continue to, 
to evaluate where we're at with our our, our facilities and our our, uh, our safety protocols. Um, as you heard um, Seth mention tonight as well, um, just just replacing cameras and things like that. It's it's it's. Uh, it's important to just realize that those don't hardly last even 10 years in, in today's world. And so you're, you're looking at already replacing things that we might get right on and replace anyway. So I, I think there'll be a, you know, obviously with all of these things, they, they all come before the board and, and, and are presented. So I think it's a good opportunity for us to, to, to work through that over these next 10 years and, uh, and keep us in that fair category on that chart that you saw for, for much longer. Um, there's, there's great risk in, in moving into that, that, that red category and, and even in the upper yellow categories. And I, I've had the fortunate um, experience to go through um, condition indexes um, for lots of years in Wyoming. That's how they, that's how they fund things. And, and it's, it's important for us, just as, as Seth just said, for all of us as homeowners, we, we have to plan on painting it every once in a while and replacing the roof every once in a while. And you've got to kind of plan on those things or all of a sudden you're in a world of, of challenge. We have, have for a long time, well, we're $25 million in deferred maintenance behind schedule already. The, the bonds that we have, have passed in the previously are just no longer here to, to help us um, help us address some of these immediate concerns. So we feel this, this, is, a, this is a very good um, minimalistic approach. We're certainly very well aware of, of, of the crazy inflation rates today, the cost of everything today. We wanna to be very sensitive to that to our, with our communities as well. And I think we would, uh, we'll do everything we can over the next couple of months to, to share out with our community and, and, and hopefully help, um, help garner their support and, into this uh, plant facility levy. Thanks. And to clarify, because we have had uh, lots of interest and in stuff, um, any officers are increasing our SS SRO impact that would come underneath potentially um, the MNO in March if we wanted to do that. So just that's a clarification for thank that. Thank you for that clarification. That's, that's correct. I, I kind of view this as, as, mm -hmm. as, as phase one, we, we take care of the, yeah. the, the f facility pieces, the tech pieces, the, the infrastructure pieces, the capital project stuff that we can use with this. Get that, get that plan put together and get those in place. And then, yes, the maintenance and operation levy will be something we'll talk about over the winter. And, and I, we, we know that there's, there's already some areas there that are staff-driven that we could improve um, upon, and, and we'll put that to work and, and have those conversations with our, our community um, this fall and winter. Great. Thank you. So I guess this evening we needed to, de to decide a little bit of where we just want to go. I think we all probably am taking, I'm assuming we want to review yes. the information. Um, I know for myself, I'd, I'd want some public comment, which we could do at our next meeting next week and provide an opportunity for that. Um, any any other things or just it would, discussion? It would be evening? helpful to get the answer to Casey's question about um, when those funds would actually mm -hmm. yeah. start coming in. Great. Anything else we'd want to request from admin or this evening that might help us, you know, like to see this maybe brought back to our meeting next Monday um, for more discussion, but anything in the next week? off the top of our head that might be helpful or no I think getting the slides and if we could make those available to the public either mm -hmm. through our you know our board site or adding those to the board book um, so if people want to reference I think would be good so they can see that information too especially if we're looking to get some feedback um, we'll have that done tomorrow Perfect. good anything else then for this evening or all right. Chair Smith, and just yes. to make sure I can wrap up, and, and, and so Marianne and I are clear. So we will, we will add an, uh, this potential action item with the resolution to your next Monday's meeting as well, and you can perhaps vote at that time. You can always delay a little longer, too, if you need to, um, as long as you just make a decision prior to July 11th. Is, we, we would really need it done a little before that, obviously, to get it all done. The sample resolution today is... Um, has been presented and it's just blank with the dollar amount so that you could choose um, and we'll just fill in whatever dollar amount you you perhaps come to you can see the district's recommendations the eight million if you decide to go for nine or six we can change that um, at, per 
you for 10 years. Correct? That is that is correct. That is correct. That is correct. As you, I, I think the just the last reminder too. I just want to reiterate it was it was shared in the presentation that that Mr. Voller Voller did. You know, the industry standard is to to really make sure you have about two percent of your replacement value um, set aside in in uh, um, long term, you know, maintenance and for for those facilities. Um, and and we're we're nowhere near close to that. Um, so that's that that number you saw at, at six million kind of based upon us already having a one and a half and we don't really have a one and a half. So you can you can see that um, from a facility perspective, this would really give you 10 years um, to to uh, keep your facilities relatively in that fair condition. And then uh, in 10 years, you'd have to decide what you're going to do at that time. And we'll include public comment then as well for that meeting next week. All right. Okay, I think that's it then for this evening. Thank you all for joining us, and we will adjourn. Do I need a mo- Oh. Public hearing. That part, do we need a motion for the public hearing? Yeah, I mean, you stated the public Yep. Yep. I said we'll now continue with the meeting agenda, so we're good. Okay, terrific. Thanks, everyone.